So for those of you that don't know us, we're Citizens Online, a digital inclusion charity, and our aim is to make sure that no one is left behind in the digital age that we now live in. We're going to host this session with myself, Helen Dobson, and my colleague James. Can't hear you, James. And I'm James, I'm Research Manager <laughs> at Citizens Online, and I'll be watching the chat, including trying to solve any uh, audio issues that any of you have. So a quick overview of the session plan for today. We've got an hour booked in, but we think we'll be finished in around 45 minutes. The presentation should take around 15, and then it's your chance to have the Q&A and get involved in discussion. We've got presentations from Dorset Council and Brighton and Hove City Council, and we'll wrap up with some resources we'll send round towards the end. We're just interested in who's on the call. You're all more than welcome, but it helps us to, um, to manage the chat and the, uh, the learning needs. So there are four options in the poll that you might be able to see on your screen. You need to have pop-ups enabled to see the poll. And the options are, you might be an elected councillor, you might work for a local authority, you might work closely with a local authority, or you might be just interested in digital inclusion. And as I said, everybody is more than welcome. It's just to give us an idea of the, the type of participants that we have. So around 77% um, of you have voted. And we can see that most of you actually work for local authorities, so that's fantastic. Um, we've also got a councillor here, and some of you uh, are interested. Um, so you might have joined our sessions before, actually, and also um, some of you work closely with councils, so that's great news. So what's the problem with this crisis in particular? We know that older people are more likely to be affected by the virus. We also know that they're more likely to lack digital skills. And also 27% of this at-risk group live on their own, which is an even bigger problem. Our work with digital inclusion, we always advocate that to really make an impact in your area, you need these three key elements. The first of which is you should be working in partnership with other organisations. The problem is too entrenched for any one organisation to solve on its own. We would recommend having some maps of your local area, some evidence to pinpoint where those most at risk of exclusion, where do they live? So then you can target your resources. We also know that digital champions are the best way to help people with digital skills. That's one-to-one -one support. A digital champion could be a volunteer, it could be someone's job, they could be paid to do it, or people could also do it as part of their existing role, for example, staff who are working with the general public. It's also worth pointing out that digital skills aren't just problem for your residents or service users or clients, they can also be a problem for your staff as well. So it's definitely worth investing in your staff digital skills also. We regularly um, have contracts with local authorities where we produce bespoke maps for them. But because of this current crisis, we've wanted to make something freely available to everyone. So we've produced a map of all the GP surgeries in England using NHS digital data. We're working on um, further data for the other parts of the UK, but that's the data that's available from NHS Digital. This is a screenshot which shows Wolverhampton and it's similar to the rest of the map for the UK. It shows GP surgeries according to how many patients they have, that's the size of the circle, how old the population of patients each surgery has, so more purple means older and therefore more likely to lack digital skills. And finally, you can turn the map to just show, as it does here, the surgeries where fewer than 30% of the patients are registered for online services. Now that might not be because those people are digitally excluded, but it's one way to potentially identify places where there could be a higher chance that people need support with digital skills. Thanks, James. 
So we've talked to a lot of local authorities uh, during the COVID crisis and there's been an absolutely fantastic response. People have really uh, sprung into action. We know that everybody's had hands on deck calling around your list of vulnerable people, checking on what they need to um, keep them safe and well at this very worrying time. However, what we're not seeing enough of is not only asking about um, those vulnerable people's needs in terms of food and health needs, but also you should, we really think that people should be asking about digital capability as well, asking those people if they have a device, can they use the device? Um, if not, that's a prime opportunity to be offering some sort of triage and support here. We've got a few presentations now from our guest speakers. Um, Sally, I know Penny from Dorset is having a few technical problems, so I wondered if we could um, have your slides first. So I'll whiz over Penny's and introduce Sally McMahon from Digital and Hove um, City Libraries. Thanks, Sally. Hello, um, everyone. Uh, um, I'm Sally McMahon. I'm the head of libraries in uh, Brighton and Hove City Council, and I'm also chair of the Digital Brighton and Hove um, partnership in the city. Uh, so lovely to see you all. Um, like everyone, we've been working for quite some time to try and address digital exclusion issues as we see it very much part of uh, social equality um, issues in the city. Um, we started working with Citizens Online in 2015 and have um, continued to work with them through this time, developing our digital Brighton and Hove network and working with a uh, collaboratively with a cross-sector partnership across the city um, to uh, develop um, a whole system approach to uh, delivering digital inclusion. Um, and uh, we've been very successful with that across the years uh, so that by um, the end of the phase two project um, and going into our phase three project this year, we had over 300 different organisations in the city working with uh, working together to try and address digital uh, uh, digital exclusion in the city um, the uh, during phase three we've moved away from direct delivery to try and support um, the uh, social sector um, but that has changed since we've moved into the covid19 uh, scenario in terms of other things that we've done up until covid19 just very quickly. Um, libraries have always been at the heart of delivering digital inclusion with free access to facilities and resources and one-to-one -one support and a lot of our community organisations have always been working with their local community to support them in their learning and accessing benefits and the council itself has been working on transforming its services to be more digital through a digital first programme. During uh, the COVID crisis, things have changed, as you can imagine. Um, the core work of Digital Brighton and Hove has become, um, uh, sorry, the uh, Digital Brighton and Hove has become integrated into the core COVID-19 response. So much so that we become a work stream of the vulnerable people cell. And this very much indicates that we regard um, digital inclusion to be a really key part of supporting the vulnerable people in the city. The network itself, Digital Brighton and Hove Network, has moved away from um, working just with organisations back towards direct delivery and coordination of support. So we have three areas that we will, are working on. Uh, one is to work with those already online but with low digital skills. And like many of you, we've been offering a helpline and also working with um, organisations such as AbilityNet to provide phone lines and other support to people who need help remotely. Um, we've also been focusing on trying to get devices or connectivity for, for people in vulnerable groups who are offline or don't have a device. And we've continued to offer support to community organisations working in this area. Um, in terms of our, within the council, obviously our libraries are closed at the moment, so we can't provide that free access. So we've been working with the network to try and support the outreach activities and lobbying for um, support for the network so we can continue this work well after COVID-19 lockdown has finished. 
So in terms of what our, our main challenges and, and, and opportunities here are, I think uh, the first thing uh, I would uh, raise is that um, although it is possible to get hold of some devices, um, they have come with a certain amount of conditions and so you have to fulfill certain criteria before you can qualify to get them. And I think whilst I understand why this is, I think it is possibly excluding some of our most vulnerable people. So I'd like to see more access to devices. Um, a lot of people want to give us devices. Uh, we're very politely saying no, because if it's old tech, that can probably be more problematic for people who are new to using digital technology. And at the moment, we don't have locally a way of repurposing that. So I'd be interested to hear if any of you have solved that issue. Connectivity is the very top of the demand from, from people. Um, they really need low cost broadband and short contracts. It's no good offering um, expensive contracts to people who are, have, no, have money, no money so they're receiving food parcels. We need to think a little bit differently to try and enable those people to get uh, connected. Um, I still um, sigh when I start using some services online. We are not still not that good at making them really accessible. And I think a lot of the work that people like Citizens Online have been doing and other organisations to try and encourage people to design uh, with accessibility in mind um, so that when we do get people who are new to tech, uh, to digital, to use services, they're not put off by the fact links don't work and, and things are complicated. Um, I know Citizens Online have been doing a lot of work with supporting uh, people who are supporting people and I think that's incredible work uh, that's going on there. One of the things I've been thinking about as well is how do we go back to supporting people face to face but keeping social distance. So once our libraries are open for instance, how are we going to provide that support while standing two metres away? Um, sustainable funding uh, I think is a really an ongoing challenge for us. Digital exclusion is often seen, too often seen, as just a technical issue and that it will go away, won't it, when we all get used to using devices. And I know that many of you and most of you on this call will really understand that digital inclusion is, is a social equality issue and that there will always be a need for support because technology moves on and we move on too. So develop, uh, get older, develop uh, disabilities um, and face new challenges using digital. So those are just a, a very quick rundown of what we in Brighton Hove have uh, been doing and some of the challenges we currently face. Thanks Sally, that's really helpful. Um, we wanted to invite Penny Siddle from Dorset to share a little bit about the Dorset experience next. Penny, are you on the call? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Ah, I can hear you and see you. So that's great stuff. We've got your slides up there. Thanks, Penny. Yes, apologies. I had technical problems. So sorry, uh, Sally and uh, James and Helen for messing up your running order. But uh, all's good now, I think. Um, so in Dorset, we, uh, so, so my name's Penny Siddle and I uh, work in the Digital Place team. Uh, uh, I manage the adoption and skills work, so the take up of Superfast Broadband uh, in the community and the Roots to Inclusion programme, which is the digital inclusion work that we do. And we've been going for about uh, five, six years, six years, um, uh, and we've built up a cohort of 75 digital champions working mostly in libraries. Uh, and offering around 300 tutorials a month uh, across the county. Um, we, uh, like Sally, we're, we're a partnership organisation. We have uh, a lot of partners and we work with them on specific projects to target particular, um, to, to particular, um, to to target particular audiences who we think uh, need it most. For example, uh, we're working in Bournemouth at the moment uh, using some funding from JP Morgan. Um, we, we were reasonably um, advanced in uh, what we were doing, but I needed support uh, and assurance that we were on the right track. So last year we invited Citizens Online 
in through their switch program to look over our shoulders, James and Helen and their colleagues um, came and, and took a close look at what we were doing um, uh, and uh, highlighted the things we were doing well uh, and made some recommendations which we were gradually working through um, uh, in the last six to eight months um, uh, until lockdown started uh, and uh, obviously things have changed. Uh, the digital place team that I work in, um, we're, we're just writing a new strategy which has these four foundations, skills, connectivity, use and digital leadership. And so having this digital inclusion activity at the heart of our digital place team and our strategy alongside connectivity, which was the reason that we were first set up as a team, um, and use, so that's applications, how, how we as a council and as a county are using it and promoting that. And digital leadership as well, which is something that uh, we, we worked with Citizens Online to develop our capacity for that. Um, so having those four foundations, I think it, it makes, um, puts skills uh, in a strong place for the council. Uh, since lockdown, uh, we have set up a digital hotline uh, so that members of the public can ring in and get help. We've repurposed our digital champions uh, and some of our staff are working alongside them too. Uh, so we can answer calls uh, right across the board um, from uh, ones around connectivity and whether people can get a better broadband connection uh, right across to um, setting up their uh, a laptop or device for the first time um, to just troubleshooting problems. Um, we work with, uh, with this as well, we work with other partners, so with, with our health, our colleagues in health, um, we're working uh, to support the rollout of Orca. Orca is an organisation which validates apps, health apps. And uh, we endorse it, our, our health um, organisations have just adopted Orca and right there in, on their home page, they have a link through to our digital hotline. So anybody who's struggling to download apps um, can come straight through to our hotline uh, and get some help. We're also, um, we normally work closely with libraries. Uh, most of our digital champions are in libraries. Uh, and at the moment, we've got some library staff who are working from home because uh, obviously the libraries are closed uh, and we're doing some work with them to upskill them so that they'll be able to help more members of the public when they come in for more of the time, not just when our digital champions are there. Uh, I'm also uh, part, uh, part of our digital cell. Um, so the digital hotline is one of dozens of actions uh, that's going on in Dorset to uh, relieve the, the crisis or approach the crisis um, through digital uh, and there are there's a whole lot of um, examples uh, on the screen I'm not going to go through all of them um, but uh, some of them are, are really big pieces of work uh, and uh, it's great that what we're doing with a digital hotline is um, is central to that as well and that all those people uh, setting up those new digital functions are aware of the hotline um, too. So that's a good way to embed it, I think. Um, how we need to take all this forward, um, we have, we, we've, we've established that there's a new readiness to cross the digital divide. People who have never made that leap and gone online before now are. People are ringing into our hotline. Um, amazing stories of uh, people living alone who used to go and visit their husband or wife in a care care home every day, sometimes having lunch with them. And now obviously they can't see them. They, a phone call is the best they can have. And, and they're now very keen to um, get onto F FaceTime or Skype to be able to see their, their, their um, husband or wife. Um, for some people, um, a hotline, the hotline is handier than drop-ins. Being able to ring in and get their answers is much easier than having to trog off to the library, make an appointment, trog off to the library. Um, whereas for our digital champions, 
being able to see the device that they're trying to fix um, or the person that they're trying to help in front of them in the library is much easier. So I'm thinking that maybe we need to have a mixture of both going forwards. Um, we also have coming into the council um, new information about vulnerable people, um, people who are contacting, uh, contacting us through the Community Shield activity. Um, uh, and, and using that as, as a route to help them get online, I think is, is going to be a new thing that we'll, we'll continue in future. So that's me finished. I think I'm handing back to Helen now. Is that right, Helen? Thanks, Penny. That was great. Thanks for that. I'll just whiz through these slides. Yes, thanks. So, so really helpful contributions for our speakers there. And I know there's been some questions in the chat that we'll come to. We've just got another poll for you before then. So that's going to pop up on the screen now. And we're interested in what have been the main challenges for providing remote con remote support during the pandemic so i think we, james is that gonna launch yeah. now so the We've options got, are sorry go, go on james you read through yeah so the, the options for this one are some of the things that sally and penny have talked about um so devices might be a challenge that you've experienced with accessing them or some of the things that sally talked about around once you have accessed them connectivity obviously getting people onto the internet or to cheaper internet the difficulties of support at a distance that Sally was, um, that Penny was referring to there, where digital champions prefer to be helping people directly, face to face. Um, Sally mentioned that some online services are sometimes not well designed to be accessible for everyone. Uh, trying to skill up more of your staff to be able to support others is obviously something that needs to be happening. So it'd be great if you could tell us if you've struggled with that. Accessing funding. Um, understanding of digital skills as a need within councils as a priority obviously that's something that varies from place to place and lastly we put on there just the volume of work because obviously that's um that's something that's significant at the moment so we've had 20 people out of the 50 that are now on the call voted so if we just encourage a few more of you to select options it's choose as many as you like on this one so you mm. you can you don't have to pick the one that's been the biggest problem. You can just pick any that you've had any experience of as a problem. So the front runner for the biggest problem at the moment is devices. So there is an organisation um, that's been set up called devices.now um, and you can apply to that organisation to um, get some devices to hand out to more to vulnerable people in need we will put the link up there um, as part of the resources that we'll send round so i think that's probably everyone we've got 38 or 50 people voted some yeah, people may not brilliant. have the option to vote so i'll just share the poll results with you now so you can just see what helen was referring to we've got 24 people who've said that devices is a problem the difficulties of support as distance is identified again it's worth reminding you all that we've We've put onto our YouTube channel on our website our recordings of the previous sessions we've done about how to provide remote support with some good tips in there about that. And then after that, we've got connectivity issues, which I think someone's asked a question about. So when we come to the chat, we'll, um, we'll talk about that. Um, interesting that we've got a good portion, 10, about a quarter of the people saying that understanding of digital skills as a need is, is, has been a challenge that you've hit because it's been interesting watching how this crisis has made that more obvious to many people but it seems like there are still some who aren't quite realizing that that, that is an issue so i think whoops stop sharing the results so i think we can go to the q a now is that right helen yes please thanks james i'll whiz the slide on yeah so i think actually what would be nice at this point is if we uh we stop sharing the screen and we can have a look at you all and all say hello to each other for the first time properly give us a wave nice to see everyone um, and i think i'm going to go first of all to our one elected councillor that we we had on the call simon which is fun for me to do because he's just up the road from me he's not quite my councillor but he's not far off so simon over to you to ask your question okay my, my question really was about thinking about future um and do either of the speakers work with um forward planning or housing associations or tenant services to make sure that 
all new developments or refurbishment of, of properties have either have high speed connections or have the potential for high speed connections. Um, we're in the Strad district and some places it's got brilliant access to digital, some of it is um, less good, should we say. Penny, do you want to start? And then Sally will come to you next. Yes. Um, so thanks. Thanks for the question. Yes, uh, because we're embedded in the digital place team, um, my colleagues uh, are rolling out su super fast broadband uh, across Dorset. That's their day job, uh, managing their contracts with uh, open reach uh, and working with other providers to reach as many people as possible. Um, uh, new developments is a problem because it's not mandatory uh, and so um, uh, it, it is it, it can be difficult although open reach do provide um, or say that they provide a plan to provide um, uh, FTTP so fiber, full fiber connectivity to all developments over a certain size um, but yes it's really important it's absolutely important it goes alongside uh, the skills work that um, everybody has a good connection. And the government have said that uh, everybody should get full fiber gigabit, gig, gig, gigabit capable lines by 2025. Um, that's very, 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 very ambitious, um, uh, according to the industry and those of us who've been working in it for a while. Um, uh, however, that is the, that's the direction of travel uh, and that will make a big difference, not only to what people can do, what, what, how people can communicate with each other, but also how councils can deliver services. Great, thanks Penny. Sally, anything to add? Um, yes, uh, sort of looking at your question on the chat uh, line, um, you mentioned tenant services and housing associations and I'd just like to say that in Brighton and Hove, yes, we have worked with um, uh, both of those. And in particular, the work that Digital Brighton and Hove have done have helped our colleagues in our seniors housing, for instance, to get a broadband installed in their uh, accommodation where it wasn't before. So um, that has been a real success from, from our perspective. Um, so I think there is a, a real understanding that this is needed, but retrofitting can be, can be a challenge. Go on, Helen. Yes. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add that I was chatting with a local authority this week, um, Brent County Council, Brent, sorry, Borough Council, and they've been working with housing associations and a couple of providers to look at installing um, free broadband in cow blocks and estates, specifically aimed at this crisis, aimed at not just older people who don't have um, internet, but actually a lot of um, families on low incomes with obviously children homeschooling, it's really important that they can access the internet. And I think that um, those broadband connections have been sort of underwritten by the housing association. So that's quite an interesting example, I think, of a partnership in place to, to get people access, especially during this time. Yeah, and I just mentioned that um, the work that Sally mentioned around the seniors housing, we have put some information about that up on our website. So I'll circulate that with the, um, the notes after the call. Jenny Morgan, could we come to you? I've unmuted you. Do you want to ask your questions about the hotline? Uh, yes, please. Um, yeah, for, for Penny, really. Very, very interested in the, the hotline. Sounds excellent, fantastic. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of interest in it. Uh, just wondering if you could explain a bit more about how it works in practice. Is there sort of, uh, I've put in the question, is there sort of a triage system? Is it is it beginners only or, or are you responding to uh, uh, gamers having issues? Um, uh, how is it staffed? Uh, are people on their DBS checked? Because obviously if people are needing help with, you know, passwords, etc. So, Sorry, I probably got too many questions for now, but but yeah, I'd be really interested in hearing the sort of practicality around that and the take up because I imagine it's very popular. Yeah, just before I hand over to you, Penny, um, Jenny also asked about how often you're doing it. Is it seven days a week? So ah, if you could yeah. tell everyone, that would be great. Yes, thank you, Jenny. Um, the hotline runs from Monday to Friday, except bank holidays, um, from 10 till 12. And at other times, uh, people can leave a message uh, and we get back to them. Uh, yes, there's a triage team, that's me and uh, three colleagues 
Uh, and so we take it in turns. Um, so obviously somebody else is doing it today. We're not suddenly going to be interrupted by a digital hotline call coming in. Um, uh, they, the calls come in to us. So this is a central uh, council number. Um, uh, and we have a list of uh, the digital champions who wanted to take part in this and a few members of staff and our digital champions are all DBS checked anyway. Um, and we asked them what their strengths were uh, and we've got a, a, a table which shows who's available on, on each day under which category, so under which um, particular area of expertise. Uh, and so the calls come in to us um, uh, and we find out a little bit about the person and where they heard about us because communications is really, really important. Uh, and we see an increase of calls when we do um, communication, obviously, really. Although we're doing, we're doing sort of underlying communication all the time because um, so, there's a, a limit to how many times we can make that a story in the, in the Dorset Echo. Um, uh, so we, we try different hooks for the, for the communication, but we also do a lot of internal communication to make sure that our colleagues uh, know about us and are uh, uh, promoting it to the service users that they're dealing with. For example, we've got a message on our main customer service uh, phone line telling people that this hotline exists. Because obviously you can't do much digitally because the key thing about those people is that they're not um, not very digital and they, they may not be online or on social media but in particular. Um, we have had um, 110 calls over four weeks, which doesn't sound that many, but it started slowly and is gradually building up. Um, any other questions, Jenny? What else? The part of it, um, Jenny, was I guess. The, oh, sorry, Jenny, you, you say it. Well, I was just going to say about, uh, aside from the triaging, are you then potentially turning some people away because we're only interested in the beginners? Is that the reason? Oh, no. No, no, no. So we, we promote that we can help uh, any question, any support anybody, no matter how small their question. Um, so some are beginners, but some are um, uh, people with quite good digital skills who are just struggling with one particular application. Some people uh, have been doing certain things online very confidently, uh, but now find that they have to do something else like shopping online or, or um, Skype is quite a big one uh, or accessing their children's applications for their homeschooling, those sort of things. So we, yes, we can, we, we deal with all, all queries. Helen? I just wanted to add as well that um, there are some similar hotlines um, in other areas around the country, not everywhere sadly, but the, the one that is national that, that we're promoting is through AbilityNet. Um, usually AbilityNet work with uh, disabled people, but during the COVID crisis, they're offering their volunteers out to anybody who needs help to get online. So if your um, local area doesn't have the hotline such as Dorset, you can ring the number through AbilityNet and we'll send that round at the end of the call. Yeah, and um, if you want to find out more about that and, and the work that AbilityNet do, you can... Um watch our last week's webinar, which, as I said, is on our YouTube channel and our, and our website. I just really wanted to emphasize um, the importance of what Penny just said about making services like this available to everyone and not overemphasizing that we help people with basic skills. It can be a bit of a stigmatizing thing to suggest that you're only helping basic and then people aren't sure whether their query is basic or not. So saying that everyone can be helped is really important. And as Penny says, it it's a really important part of digital inclusion that it's not a problem that can be solved everyone comes across things that they are not quite sure how to do at some point in their lives including us at citizens online um so, yeah the next questions um jan clark if i come to you but i think this has there's some other stuff that other people have asked that i'll follow up once you've asked your question but i've unmuted you jan if you want to say a yeah, version of your thank question. you it, it, I think uh, mostly it has been answered, but the point is if we can get a device to somebody, how are they going to access the internet anyway? You know, um, uh, yeah, basically that was... Helen, could you share the slides again and just go to the, the, um, the ones on this, just so we can quickly remind people yeah, one... we have got some information on this. One way to um, do this. 
So Peter, we'll come to your um, points about this in a second, but before we do... I was going to say before, can I oh. just say that in Brighton and Hove, that's a very good point. You don't want to just give out equipment and there's no follow-up. So um, we've been very uh, particular about working with other organisations, other agencies, so that we can um, make sure we follow up with contact from one of the digital champions to provide support for the individuals who have been given devices. So you're quite right, just getting the equipment isn't enough. There has to be that wraparound support uh, ready so that when they start using the equipment, there's somebody there to help. So a couple of things to mention on getting online. So one aspect of this is helping people to actually go through the technical process of doing that. So Digital Unite, one of our partners who we've also had a call with that's recorded that you can watch back. They have a website page, a really simple guide just to connecting to Wi-Fi. Um, it's worth emphasizing that a lot of people won't have a fixed broadband connection. So in that case, you might need to support them around mobile Wi-Fi. You might be buying dongles as well as actual um, devices like smartphones or tablets. You can get dongles for about £30, sometimes cheaper. Um, mobile data bundles often start at around £4 a month. There are some cheaper ones out there. GifGaff have got quite an interesting setup at the moment where their customers can chip into a pot to fund other people to have free access. And then internet companies have removed data caps. So if people have got fixed broadband, they should be able to um, access more than they would normally would able, be able to. So if they were able to afford some level of connectivity, they should now be able to get a lot more. NHS sites and some of the other key information sites have been zero rated for data. So whereas if someone watches a video, that will still um, very quickly use up their data. If they need to access some of the really core information, they should be um, able to get that. And there's more information at that link. And as I said, we'll share the slides around so you can have a look at the, the greater detail. One specific option that we signpost people to that people don't often know about is BT Basic. Now, BT Basic is a, a low cost phone program, but it also has a broadband element, BT Basic plus broadband. Helen, if you can bring that slide up, I think. Yeah, I'm not there. sure where that slide is. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah. So this is a fairly, um, fairly low, although it will still be unaffordable to some people. It's £10 a month for 15 gigabytes of data. You get Wi-Fi, you get virus protect and parental controls, but you can only access it if you're receiving certain benefits, which are listed there, income support, income-based job seekers allowance, the guaranteed credit form of pensions credit, income-related employment and support allowance, ESA, and certain applications of universal credit, you have to be on zero earnings. So in other words, if you're getting a kind of um, tax credits version of universal credit, you won't, you won't necessarily be able to access this. We emphasize these kind of restrictions partly because it's not very encouraging for someone to hear about this offer and then find out that they're unable to apply. And also you might end up having to help this person to apply for universal credit, which is a digital by default benefit in order to be able to then show that they can have cheaper internet. So it's quite complicated at the moment when you can't necessarily be using their current internet connection and you're providing remote support. So it's worth knowing it's out there, but it's not ideal. Um, at Citizens Online, we have been calling for the government to make internet access free during the pandemic. You can read more about that on our website, but obviously that's, uh, that's an ongoing issue. Um, I wonder if I wanted to bring in Peter here because you had some other comments and questions around this. So I've unmuted you, Peter Domit. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, the first question is, is obviously that um, where there's paid for, um, and obviously it's very interesting in the gift gap, so I've got to have a look at that, is that um, is anyone had any joy with going to the uh, Wi-Fi hotspot providers? Obviously Vodafone's just dropped out, um, but we've still got Virgin and we've still got BT Phone to say, if we're supplying a device, we can give them the Mac address so we can, you know, so we know it's gonna be linked to a particular thing, they can put a data cap on it. Um, but I've not had any joy. I've been in through their press office as well as their technical support and their customer services, business ones, and had nothing back. So any answers from Penny or Sally? Sally, you're shaking your head, Penny. Yeah, I can't help with this one. Is, is can anyone it's from the floor? Has anyone got any idea? Any uh, experience? I mean, I'll just I'll just mention quickly that um, I think at one point on our I think it's still true our digital Brighton and Hove website. So when we set up some of our projects, we create what we call a signposting site, and in normal times that lists 
uh, physical locations where people can go to get support as well as relevant phone numbers and things like that um, and I think in Digital Brighton and Hove we still have a list of the um, free Wi-Fi hotspots as part of that map um, that is something that is relatively easy to map you can get a list online it might be a bit out of date but you can get a list online of the locations of those um, free Wi-Fi hotspots and you could share them with people I mean from my personal experience, it's not actually a great process signing up to those free um, hotspots. And I imagine it would be difficult for someone with, with low digital skills who didn't have an internet connection of their own anyway. But obviously, if it's someone with, um, who's moving around and has, like a, um, is using up their data and finding they need somewhere to do just a few tasks, that might be helpful to them. We, Peter, yeah, I was going to say, Greg, what we're yeah. doing is, is that we're, we're supplying devices. We, we're, we're fortunate we actually got some devices um, prior to lockdown. Uh, and we're supplying them out to people who are socially isolated. And we've got tech angels to actually support them, get them uh, online and get the most out of them. The difficulty is, is network and using, let's say, my five novels versus business pieces is an expensive way to do it. And it doesn't give them any independence. So potentially, so we, we have a, a thing which is that, as you say, they can't do it without support, but we can actually support them. It's useful points, Peter. I don't, I don't know what more we can add on that. So no, no, it's not. But it's, 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 it's worth knowing. I'll have a, I'll have a look at the free ones, but see what we got from there. Yeah, I think. I mean, this is an issue we'll be returning to in future. We haven't so far much focused on the kind of cost issues, both around devices and um, accessing online. But we'll probably hope to cover that in a future week. Although we have got quite a few um, sessions already booked yeah. up, so it won't be for a while. Great. I'll make sure I'm tied into them. Um. The next question, Mike War, if I try and unmute you, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes. Um, so lo lots of work has gone on to um, identify our vulnerable communities and and um, those who, who might be excluded through data, etc. But I was just wondering if if any, if either Sally, um, uh, Sally or Penny had any. Um, examples of how they've gone about trying to try and trying to identify those who may fall through the gap of the data that you know, the people who don't automatically come up on on their databases and systems and whether they've made any uh, sort of uh, attempts to, to go out and reach these other people uh, penny you put your hand up and then we'll come to you sally yes i i personally i for us, it's too early at, at the moment. We're dealing with the people who are coming to us, finding us, and we we do what we can, as I've, I've said, to communicate the, the hotline to everybody. Uh, in normal times, it really is a problem. Uh, it really is very, very difficult to find the hard to reach, and that's why we work with partners who are working, like, like health, um, uh, and so on, who are in touch with the, with a broader section of society. With the new data coming in from the shielded community, uh, I, as I said before, I think there will be a potential to use that data to reach them, but we haven't done that yet. Um, it's something we're starting to do, looking at devices and how we can offer that end-to-end -end service from providing a device right through to the digital skills to use it, including the connectivity and setup and so on. Um, not yet. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, I would just add to that. I, I, I agree. I think the focus has been on those uh, where the demands are coming in. Um, one of the things, the areas we want to focus on more will be uh, reaching out to those uh, who are shielded. Um, but I think the key, the key thing here is to make use of the networks. You know, the council uh, and single organisations can't do it all. What we want to do is work with other organisations. So, for instance, I know um, David in Digital Brighton and Hove has been working with homeless uh, charities uh, to particularly work with them. I mentioned seniors housing. I think the other, another area we might focus on is contacting people through food deliveries to see if they need any support. Uh, we haven't done that yet, but it's an obvious way through. Um, so it's working through other organisations who may already have contact with some of those more vulnerable groups that I think is the key 
um, so that we can help them to help their clients. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, uh, just, I mean, I think that's, it's worth going back to our, what we said right at the beginning about our approach at Citizens Online, which is very much about trying to contact those through people through other organizations that those people are already in contact with, building a network and embedding some kind of triage system or digital support throughout the contact points that people are um, encountering. Um, the other thing obviously that we do is the mapping and um, on top of the sort of GP thing that I pointed to earlier just to mention some of the other things that we tend to map that might be useful to people and you may be able to do this yourselves. Um, the DWP, the Department of Work and Pensions have a statistics website called Stat Explore and from there you can get relatively up-to-date information about where benefit claimants are located in terms of um, what are called census output areas, which is about 100 households worth sort of area. So it's fairly granular. And things like pension credit, which is a, um, a benefit for pensioners on low incomes, can be a useful way to identify people who are most likely to lack digital skills, i.e. who are older and on lower incomes, which are both factors that we know are important. Similarly, housing benefit claimants or universal credit claimants, we can, you can find those. And housing benefit claimants outside of COVID is a good measure because we know that all those people are ultimately going to be asked to apply for universal credit. Same with ESA, employment support allowance. So those are, those are some ways that we, we recommend and we, we can produce those maps for people if they're interested. Um, we're kind of running out of time. I think, Eleanor, we've tried to answer your question about places where people can go for Wi-Fi. Um, I mean, one thing that might be worth saying about this is that the NHS obviously makes, um, has, there's a, a scheme making NHS Wi-Fi publicly available to access. A bit difficult for people to go to some of those locations at the moment, mm -hmm. but that is something that other organisations might pursue, making their own Wi-Fi have a separate, well-protected publicly accessible version. I know some councils have done that with their own Wi-Fi. Um, so that might be something that could be pursued to, to map further places where people can go. Um, Susie, I just thought we'll do your question before we close. Susie Roberts. Hi. Um, hi. Yeah, I, I work for the sensory team at Adult Social Care in Gloucestershire, uh, the County Council. Um, I'm a rehab officer. We do very hands-on work with people. Um, just helping them to get their independence back up together after they've had some uh, significant sight loss. Um, we have a sort of surface knowledge of the sort of technology that's available to visually impaired people. Uh, well, actually quite good knowledge, really. Um, I'm just interested in what people in other areas are, you know, if um, people with sight impairments have identified themselves as needing specific help, um, if there's any links with technology companies, access technology, companies or agencies. I know AbilityNet certainly have an interest in this. Um, just interested in hearing from other areas really who's doing what, if anything really. Sally, do you want to go? Oh, Helen, go on. Oh, I was just going to kick off with that. Yeah, I mean, sounds like absolutely brilliant uh, work that you, you're doing in Gloucestershire. I do know of um, a few agencies around the country. So, um, you know, vision support in Harrogate, uh, they're linked in with the network there. So I know that they're supporting. But as a catch all, obviously the RNIB do, do fantastic work and have recommendations of, as you said, you know, there's, there's amazing technology out there now that can uh, help people with the, the, the sight readers and, um, you know, visual, um, sorry, audio aids that are all um, available on the web um, and AbilityNet are another great uh, provider that, that you mentioned. Can I just ask, so for anyone in Gloucestershire, is there any way that they can contact you and your service? Um, through the Adult Help Desk. Uh, right. The County Council, yeah. Great. Thanks. Sally or Penny, do you want to say anything about this? I would just echo that. I was going to say the RNIB, if, if uh, Helen hadn't already said that, um, uh, being head of libraries, I'm particularly interested in, for everybody, not just people with sight loss, to keep, not just get information and essential services, but keep themselves entertained and provide relaxation and, and um, uh, you know, a di diversion from the crisis that we're in. So uh, getting access to reading, audiobooks, um, you know, all that sort of thing is incredibly important for people's mental health. Anything, Penny? Uh, there has been a, a 
Sally, hasn't there uh, an increase in registrations for library services during this this time? So, um, uh, oh yeah, incredible. I mean, you know, um, um, many fold in all authorities because uh, we're all still offering digital services, um, and you can still join online. It's all free. Uh, we can give you a membership number, and using that, you can then get access to an enormous—I mean, literally thousands and thousands and thousands of different books audiobooks, e-comics, e-magazines, newspapers, as well as information and, and um, other help, um, all for free through your local public library. And I really would encourage anybody working with people who are isolated at the moment, or anybody really in this crisis, to go online, sign up to your local library service and take advantage of that. Fantastic, thanks. Um, Liam in the chat has mentioned that in Lewisham they have a talking newspaper that's sent out on USB every week and I know that happens locally in Stroud as well. Um, I think they've just moved theirs to be online as well as um, sent out um, and that may be happening in lots of other places around the country. I really echo the stuff about the libraries, there's an awful lot of information on there and much of it will be suitable for people with sight loss or other um, impairments. Um, we are going to do a session in the near future around this because it's Global Accessibility Awareness Day on the 21st of May. Um, we have, as I mentioned, done a session with AbilityNet covering some of the issues that are raised around disability and use of the internet. So you can watch that on our, um, the events page of our website. Um, the session that we do on Accessibility Awareness Day will be more around designing services to ensure that they can be used by people with impairments. So so that screen readers can read all the content so that people can navigate through websites using keyboards or other methods, things like that. Um, I'll just mention before we finish this chat, uh, Simon, you had an interesting question about decarbonizing digital access. I think that's something we'll have to cover in a, in a separate session rather than now, but it's certainly an interesting question and something we've looked into a little bit ourselves. So hopefully we can organize something uh, on that in the future. So Helen, if you can just put me to the, Q&A slide and then from yeah, there I can sure. go through the final wrap-up stuff. So I think this is the first one. So just for people who haven't joined one of these calls previously, we have a blog on our website about taking your first steps online. It's probably more suitable for someone who is helping someone to take their first steps online, but it may also be useful as something to go through with someone when you're talking to them over the phone. Lots of ideas in there for things to, to look into and an overall approach of kind of focusing on what's of interest to that person. Digital Unite, one of our partners in the One Digital program, have some great offers and information at the moment. Um, they run something called the Digital Champions Network, which provides training for people who become digital champions, i.e. people who are supporting others. That's free during COVID-19. They've also got some top tips for people who are doing remote digital champion work. So helping people who are already digital champions to figure out how to do that in the current circumstances. And finally, they have a whole huge range of guides and resources around specific things, apps and websites and how to use different aspects of the online world from shopping to banking and social connection and all the rest of it. We've got a single page on our website that tries to cover some of the best resources that we've been able to identify. A lot of this signposts to resources that Digital Unite have put together, but there's some other information too. It's not just for people who are have low or no digital skills. There's also some resources in there that are helpful to people who have recently started remote working or are doing video conference calls like these. And one thing I'll mention at that point, by the way, is that you may have noticed we've got captions running at the top of the screen. That's not something that Zoom provides, but um, through PowerPoint, you can access uh, subtitles if you're using Office 365. Uh, did I miss one, Helen? There's one before this. Um, I've forgotten the full acronym, but the Society of Innovation Technology and something else beginning with M um, have got a survey running at the moment, particularly around local authorities and their response to COVID-19, which you may be interested in filling in or at least looking out for the results from when that comes out soon. And then, yes, the next one is about our next session. We had a lot of questions on previous sessions about supporting people with English as an additional language. So that's going to be the focus of our session next time. We're hoping we're going to have three panelists. Might not get all of them, but there'll be people talking about the challenges that migrants, refugees, asylum seekers and others with English as an additional language are facing at the moment and how we can support them with digital skills specifically.